Okay, we have asked questions. We're ready for you guys. Hey, Joe, uh, a lot of people ask you this, but what's your favorite comic book? I could give you the Stan Lee answer, and that is, well, my favorite comic book It's the last one I read. <laughs> um, and the last one you sold? Uh, the last one I No, no, I, you know, I, I still love to read. Um, I'd say, um, oh, my favorite comic books probably are still those two that I started with back in 1967. Amazing Spider-Man 51 and Fantastic Four 65. I own the original art to the splash page of Fantastic Four 65, so I'm probably the only guy who owns the first page of Lee and Kirby he ever read. Okay, and I also own a page from Amazing Spider-Man 51. So those I've got my holy grails of collecting. I don't need anything else, um, and I can still read those, and it'll take me right back to to that time and and how how awesome it was to get into comics and to, and to really uh, become a devoted fan. Nice. Um, do you have any advice for people who want to get into comic books? Like, uh, I'm just going to say it. I want to get into comic books. I want to be a writer. I want to be a writer. Uh, the, uh, the advice that I've always heard from people uh, in the business is if you want to be a writer, number one, you read a lot, and number two, you write a lot. And uh, Ray Bradbury always said that uh, he needed to write a thousand words a day. And the way, uh, the analogy that I use is, is uh, baseball players, because I'm a big baseball fan, that you're not going to become an all-star in the major leagues until you've done your time in the minor leagues, until you've had probably a thousand times at bat in the minor leagues. And before that, there's a whole lot of training that goes in before you even make it to the minor leagues. So um, I, I would say read a lot and write a lot. Um, continue to take writing classes and uh, uh, literature classes. Uh, learn some of the great stuff uh, because um, you'll see that uh, a lot of current comic book stories will borrow elements from, from classic literature, uh, whether it's... Uh, you know, the redemption story of Superman, uh, you know, this uh, strange visitor from another world who pops up on Earth. Um, you know, there, there are stories uh, uh, in comics that echo the myths and the, and the literary legends from, uh, from days gone by. So read a lot, write a lot. Hey, how's it going, Joe? Uh, about 10 years into the store being open is when the comic book bust started to come about. What plan did you put into place to survive it and thrive? That's a good question. Um, I think what happened when, uh, when there was that huge surge of people buying multiple copies of hot books and tons of stuff coming out on the market, what we did, and I made a really conscious effort as we were going into that, to manage things on the way up so that they would be more manageable when things would start to turn. And I think that's what's allowed us to survive for 24 years is that um, uh, some stores, uh, some retailers will allow you to walk into a store and buy every copy of an issue off the rack. And we don't, okay, we don't do that. Uh, because what we want to do is we want to make sure that everyone gets a fair shot at every book in the store. And, uh, and so what that does is it manages our growth, but it also manages the downtime. So we weren't sitting on thousands and thousands of unsold, terrible books that other stores were. Yes, we had a lot of them. I made a deal uh, in, uh, 10 years ago, I think, uh, close to that, that uh, uh, to sell 279 long boxes of stuff that was not very good. Um, but uh, that was accumulated over the 15 years prior. Um, but I, I really think that uh, what we try to emphasize here is uh, reading for entertainment. Comics are entertainment first, and uh, whatever you happen to get out of them later is a bonus. Whether you sell them for money or uh, you uh, donate them to a charity and get a tax write-off, any of that stuff is a bonus. The, the, the value in comics is in reading them. And so that really saved us through the, the, the difficult periods. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Thanks for the question. Let me add to that, actually, Jay, before we, while we yeah. wait for the next one. What do you, in your opinion, what do you think led 
uh, that bust in the 90s? Was, was one reason or a variety of reasons? Um, I, 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 there were a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, every company in the comics business is in business to make money. Right. And if they saw that there's a way to make money by doing uh, zillions of different covers or uh, trying to come up with a gimmick like a chromium cover or hologram this or uh, serially numbered that, th they do it. But it's how retailers respond to that that makes the difference. And um, uh, if the, the quality of the work on the inside uh, uh, is up to the, the, the marketing that they do on the outside, then things work. But if the interior of the book does not hold up to the promotion or the marketing of it, then there's a problem. And I think really that's what the problem was with the, with the 90s, is that uh, uh, the content became secondary to the package. So you really couldn't judge a book by its cover. Right, right. <laughs> so whoever has the next question, step right on up. OK, hi. So. What do you know about the currently popular My Little Pony Friendship is Magic franchise, and do you think it would ever become a popular comic book? Well, uh, you mean uh, the My Little Pony that has the bronies and stuff in it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I do, I do think that there's a, a market for those as a comic book, and wouldn't mind seeing a publisher do something with it. Um, we're always willing to take a look at uh, titles that... Um, uh, appeal to whatever audience there is for them and uh, you know we we carry six or seven hundred different titles here every month and if you look at that uh, some of those titles sell hundreds of copies each and others sell one or two copies each well we make the decision to bring in a lot of different things and when we see something that's a, a, a well-known property like My Little Pony we, yeah we'd want to bring that in are you gonna are you gonna do one for us are you gonna draw a comic Okay, good. Let me add to that also. Is, <coughs> is there anything, any book that you won't carry in the store? Yes, uh, we don't carry adults only material. Um, and um, we, do, uh, we do sort of um, make decisions based upon what has sold, what hasn't sold, what our customers are asking for. Um, and uh, a lot of it is really directed by, uh, by all the Flying Colors faithful who come in here and tell us what they're into and what they like. And, um, but uh, we carry probably uh, just as wide a range of material as any store, uh, at least in the Bay Area, if, um, you know, one of the widest selections in the country. But, um, uh, but we are still selective about what we uh, have. We have limited space. Uh, and uh, we have a limited uh, uh, number of customers. So it's, it's all based upon what they want and, and what we feel fits the store best and what we can sell best. Okay. Hi, right, go ahead and ask a question. What's your favorite um, classic comic book artist? Favorite classic comic book artist? <sighs> it's really hard to choose one because I, I, I go through my periods where... Uh, you know, I, I, I just, I love John Romita Sr. I think he's, he's great. He draws beautiful women. He does, does Spider-Man the way I want him to do Spider-Man. Uh, I, I, I love Jack Kirby for the action and the power and the zillions of concepts that come at you from panel to panel. I like Jim Steranko for what he did with uh, sort of changing the language of comics that a, a lot of uh, later uh, artists have uh, taken to his work and and seeing what he, what he added to the language of comics to make it better. Um, I, I like uh, Dan DiCarlo from Archie Comics. I think it was a terrific artist and could do a lot of different things. Classic artist, um, I, I'll tell you, I'll give you the one who I think is probably the um, uh, most unsung artist because he died at an early age, and that was a guy named Joe Manili who worked for Timely Comics in the 1950s. He did a lot of work with Stan Lee. Uh, he did uh, romance comics, he did funny animal comics, he did kids comics, he did westerns, he did uh, uh, horror and fantasy and all that kind of stuff. And sadly, he, he died at the age of about 32. Uh, he was hit by a train. And 
the biggest what if in Marvel Comics history is what if Joe Manili lived because he would have been one of the t go to guys along with uh, Jack Kirby uh, and Steve Ditko when, when the Marvel Universe started. And Ditko is another one I need to put in there as someone that I really love. But um, what would it have looked like if Joe Manili did Iron Man or the Avengers or Sergeant Fury or, or, or one of those? Um, I, think, uh, I think that's a really, um, a, a really cool thing to ponder. But um, he was a talent who, got, uh, who, who died much too young. Um, Disney's acquisition of Marvel, what's your opinion on that? Um, I think uh, Mickey looks good in spandex. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I think it's a, it was a really smart move for Disney to acquire Marvel because Disney was known as a company that uh, has a ton of properties that appeal to girls and, uh, and Marvel is a company that has a lot of properties that appeal to boys. So it's, it's like a match made in heaven, really. Um, uh, I just hope that uh, um, everything works out well for it in the long run and, and that they, uh, they remember that comics are an essential part of what, what's made Marvel great. Uh, with Free Comic Book Day, um, how much input have you had from your initial idea to where it's the major publishers are, are doing their publishing based on Free Comic Book Day as an event and getting all retailers all over the world? How much have you done to get it on that trajectory? Um, I still consult with them all the way through, uh, and they, they keep me in the loop on pretty much all of the decisions that are happening. Um, uh, thankfully, I, my bright idea was to turn the whole thing over to Diamond Comic Distributor, so I wouldn't be the one calling every single retailer or calling every publisher. They have the connections to be able to do that, and they do a really great job at it, and especially at a part of you know, there were three and a half million comics that had to be pushed through the distribution pipeline uh, for Free Comic Book Day this year. So that was a huge undertaking for them, and they did it extremely well. Um, I do give them ideas uh, on occasion, and there's a couple things that we're, we're working on. Um, uh, every year, we like to tweak things just a little bit to, to keep it fresh. Uh, and I think uh, all the different publishers are really stepping up their game. Uh, I was... Um, I was pretty heavily involved in the um, uh, approval to get the Mouse Guard uh, Labyrinth hardcover done for this year's Free Comic Book Day, which was sort of a, uh, a big deal that we, it was the first uh, all new original graphic novel that we gave away for free on Free Comic Book Day. So uh, we're just, we look at, uh, uh, I, I'm involved in a lot of different pieces of it, but honestly, I just, um, uh, I turn uh, al uh, almost all the work is done by Diamond, and I get all the credit, and that's probably not a fair deal. So, the final question, Joe. Will that be your final question? Not from. The <laughs> um, I want to know what it means to you to be a comic book retailer. Um, what does it mean? Well, actually, what it means for me is uh, I. I get to have a job doing what I love to do. Um, I, I have been able to turn this into a career rather than just a job. Uh, but uh, for me, it's uh, when, when I opened the store, I was a huge, huge collector. And I had to sort of turn off my, my fan as a collector and turn it on as a retailer. So my, uh, my goal now is to get everyone what they want rather than me getting everything that I want. So um, to me, uh, a, a being a comic book retailer just means that I get to sell the coolest entertainment in the world. I get to sell the stuff that um, uh, becomes the next big thing in other media all the time. And um, I, get to, uh, I get to be a part of something that I really enjoy. And um, you know, the whole secret of success is if you love your job and you love going home, uh, you, you've got a great life, and, and, and both of those things are true for me. So I, I feel very blessed by the whole thing. Last question. Was that that was last question. Those okay. are questions from the Flying Faithful, um, Flying Colors Faithful, I should say. So now, fun time, party time. This is not just the pilot. This is also what we're calling it Hulk, Hulk Smash, Smash Brownie Day. Day. And also a big thank you to all yes. faithful. Yes. Do you want to tell us what the thank you for? I just want to thank everyone for 
uh, a wonderful, uh, we had our best month in May, uh, best month in 24 years, uh, had our best free comic book day ever. Um, and really, it seems to be about the best time for comics uh, that I've seen in a long, long time. So this is a thank you to all those people who support us uh, day in and day out, week in and week out, year in and year out. I mean, we're, we wouldn't be here if people didn't come in. So, um, uh, so we just want to thank everyone for, for, for being here and for being one of the Flying Colors faithful.